Um, so that said, I have a I have a pile of references for this stuff. Um, in particular, um, these lenses are in Scala Z. So if you just if you already use Scala Z, you already have these lenses as described in this talk. Um, so they're available to you right now. The names I think are identical to what I used here. Um, maybe modulo one or two things that works a little bit differently. Um, so we've got we've got those already available for you. Um, I've got a discussion of like some alternate lens designs. The one that I gave here is not the only way you can build a lens. You can actually build a slightly more efficient encoding of them, which will probably be in the next version of Scala Z. Um, because right now, the, if you think about it, the getters and the setters that I defined there kind of have to do, if you go to modify something, I have to go all the way down to get the value and bring it back out to you. Then I have to go all the way back down to put it back in and, mute, and then come back out. So if I fuse together my getter and setter a little bit differently, I can actually share that work. Um, it, it's a trade-off. It's not a pure win in Scala. It's always a win in Haskell. Um, just because we're not as lazy here. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's a number of talks. Uh, uh, Jeremy Gibbons gave a nice, uh, has a nice paper on the topic. Uh, Russell O'Connor actually wrote one fairly recently that's very categorical in nature that talks about a lot of these kind of designs. But uh, really, when it comes down to it, uh, any questions? So I'm more than happy to. And I'm sorry for talking a mile a minute through that. <laughs> Go for it. Do you ever do any kind of performance comparison between what, some of the using the lenses versus just doing the old? Kind of so actually, so actually, the, well, this was originally going to capstone with a, with a case study, but I didn't think I was going to have time, and I'm glad that I didn't include it. Um, so one of the things that we actually had was we had some code that was using. Um, a bit of functional stuff to build to serialize a bunch of uh, a bunch of data out to a database, right? We have we have a lot of we have a lot of a lot of data that we use at uh, Clarify that we were basically dumping to plain old Java objects and then serializing the front files, and that really wasn't very good when you needed one piece of information out of it because then you had to go deserialize this whole ridiculously large report and then go get the one little fact that you needed. So we started converting to dump that over to to databases. Um, and in order to omit nice star schemas, et cetera, from that, we wound up actually building um, sort of tools for flattening this data, um, basically functional tools for doing, for doing the job. Um, and those tools, that when we, when we first wrote them, we actually used mutation behind the scenes to pull it off. Um, and then that kind of ran afoul of the fact that streams don't get memoized in Scala, so I was getting different values out of the streams the second time I looked at them, and we wound up with some really horrible consistency and scalability problems. Uh, the next step up wound up blowing out to multiple uh, billions of records in memory uh, that didn't need to be there. We finally got it down to the point where it's holding on to thousands of things, but it was through the strength of, of using this framework and the fact that we could sort of replay these computations and know that they wouldn't change the world. Um, so it's not necessarily a benchmark comparison, but the fact that we were able to um, strip six orders of magnitude off of our, our, in mem our memory requirements was, was kind of nice. Um, from a performance standpoint, um, you are calling anonymous functions, you're calling methods on things, you're looking at, you know, it, it's going to be slower. Um, there, there, is a, there is a performance tax that comes with, well, using Scala in the first place, because everything tends to go through object by the time erasure gets done. So, um, you're not paying much more than the tax you're already stuck paying for using Scala. Okay. Any other? I have a question, and it's kind of open-ended, and you may not have a good sense of this because, or, or you know, because lenses are relatively new. But I'm curious. So, obviously, you know, some of the sort of bug avoidance that you get from functional programming <laughs> is because, you know, you, you have to be, you know, I explicit about what's being changed and and, and mm -hmm. so forth. And and uh, you know, by if, if, I mean, in a way, you've almost sort of implemented a 
something that looks suspiciously like a complete simulation of <laughs> a processor on which you can execute imperative instructions. Yes. So at what point does someone using <clears throat> lenses start writing the same bugs that they had written in their imperative <laughs> code before? It is a problem. Um, it's, not, it's not a perfect solution. Um, again, it, it, it solves the sort of composition problem that we have with mutation when we, we, we need to get something five levels deep in a, in a you know, um, and, and change it without having to write custom code for doing it every time. Um, that's sort of the, the problem that it's targeted at. The um, imperative code sucks to debug is a problem that's bigger than I think I can tackle. <laughs> but it's more with the state mode. Yeah, and we're still, yeah. it's, it's actually, so in, 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 in some sense, this actually does solve some of those problems, because I don't have to worry about if I mute it, because I can hold on to my old state and I can revert to it. Yeah. I can always undo, right? This has given me a sort of unlimited undo functionality to whatever state that I wanted to grab onto. Um, I don't have to work in the state monad. I can work in like a state monad transformer and then have multiple possible computations running at the same time or in parallel or, you know. I think it's also that, uh, like, what you're attributing to problems with imperative programming doesn't really have anything to do with the fact that your programming is imperative. It's that it's not purely functional. Those two things are not you know, in opposition to each other, as you've as seen. So, I mean, in some sense, we still don't have the exceptions floating around. Sure. We don't have a lot of that. Sure. A lot of that mix. We've, uh, we've hidden some of the usual ills. But if you if you are doing a lot of stuff in the state monad, it can be, even though the state is localized to within the monad, you still have to think about all the same things of, mm -hmm this update happens before that update. Okay. I mean, you don't have to worry about multiple threads modifying things at the same time or anything like that. Yeah, the sequencing is guaranteed. Yeah, the I mean, is but you still have to think in terms of this instruction happens before that instruction, and mm -hmm. I need to take that into account. So, I mean, so actually, one of the th things we did when we first switched over, we switched over to using lenses, um, but then we wound up basically building state actions that were returning streams. But the problem was is that wasn't um, sufficient to our needs. That's when I mentioned the, the sort of we were dealing with billions of things in memory, it was because we were building a really complicated stream. But we had to build the stream all up front. Because we when we were done with it, we had to know what the state was. So we had to hold on to this whole stream that was just like transient data that was going to be serialized out to this. Um, so this actually motivated, there's a, there's a, a stream Monad transformer, or there's a stream transformer and a um, list transformer in Scala Z that know how to work with things like state and so forth, so that we can actually build, so we can use lenses in a in a sort of incremental way while we're working while we're working our way across big streams of data. So you're still like 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 Paul was saying, you're still kind of thinking about when stuff happens in that case, because I don't want one big state action that's going to yield the stream. I want a state action that's going to yield the next thing that I want to emit in the stream and give me my new state. And the next thing that's going to yield and then give me my new state. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not a panacea. Is there a compiler plugin or code generator or something that would add lenses for existing case classes? <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it. It's one of the things I've been kicking around. So that's, that's why I mentioned that it, that, that it would be fairly easy for the, the compiler to admit. Now, one of the things that was in the case study that I, that I didn't um, bring with me um, was sort of an example of how we tend to use them in practice. And that is that we, we tend to build a, a case class and then the sort of a companion object, we throw all the lenses for that case class. Um, and then we can just compose through use of the, the companion object. Um, but it would be really, really convenient to have a compiler plugin that just said, hey, given this annotation, just go build all my lenses for me. Thank you very much. Um, and so I want it. I don't have it yet. If you want to write it, I will happily. Uh, <laughs> thank you for it. I will happily thank you for it. And yeah, use it. You'll, you'll get very early bug reports. <laughs> I think that's everything.